had the opportunity to see him on the day that he was informed of being named number one on the New York Times bestseller list, but I, however, did not. So this was my first opportunity to say congratulations, Bob. Okay, um, if you'll bear with me a minute, um, I want to tell you about Ezra Pound's Six Types of Writers, because I think that um, several of these pertain to Robert Price. Um, first, he has the inventors, the men who found a new process or whose extent, whose accident work gives us the first known example of a process. I think with L.A. Requiem, we can say without a doubt that Bob Fitt falls into the category of inventors. There are the masters, the men who combined a number of such processes and who used them as well or better than the inventors. And you also, as you were working up to L.A. Requiem, did exactly that. Um, the diluters are the people who came after the first two kinds of writers and couldn't do the job quite as well. Well, we know a number of those, but I don't think you fit in that category. <laughs> Good writers without salient qualities are people who are fortunate enough to be born with the literature of a given country um, when it's in wor good working order or some um, particular branch of writing is healthy. There are the writers of Belles Lettres. These are the people who didn't really invent anything, but who specialized in some particular part. Again, I don't think Bob falls into any of those categories. However, the last category, the starters of crazes. <laughs> he definitely falls into that category. People who have read my blog know that I have credited him with um, pulling me in to my enjoyment of the crime fiction genre. But one other thing that um, he gets to have credit for is that I've met several of my very, very best friends through um, being crazies. We all share this common love of his work. We don't always share a love of all of the same books, but we share a love of his books. And so I asked them to help me out a little bit with this interview. And They're ganging up on me. <laughs> it's going to be a feeding frenzy right now. What we're going to do is we're going to play kind of like a version of the newlywed <coughs> game, only this is how well do the fans know your, you and your work. Okay. Are you ready for this? What do I do? You respond to the questions and then I will show you what they came up with. Okay. All right. So the first question is, what side of the bed does Joe Pike prefer to sleep on? <laughs> I don't know, Jack. Which side does he prefer? According to the fans, what bed Joe Pike doesn't sleep or... Um, many of the female fans said, why, of course, my side of the bed. <laughs> I love my readers. <laughs> if the cat came home with the companion feline, what would Elvis call it? <laughs> I don't know, Jen. <laughs> Lucy. <laughs> You see what it's like to be me? <laughs> what is Elvis's preferred brand of soap? I don't know, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real soap. It's a real soap. And uh, the fan who submitted this said, do you think I'm lying? And she provided the picture. So. <laughs> and, it, and it has a rope on it, too. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it's, a, it's a picture of the box. It says, tough guy soap. <laughs> they sell that in prison. <laughs> if Carol Starkey won an all-expense-paid trip anywhere of her choosing, where would she go? I don't know, Jen. <laughs> Las Vegas, because it's the bomb. Oh. Oops, I'm sorry. What was the last book Lucy Chenier read? I don't know. <laughs> Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And this was one of the nice entries that we got on that one. This is the best interview I've ever had. <laughs> okay. Um, fans can be rather 
passionate about certain characters. You don't know that at all. No. <laughs> um, was there ever a character that had that really the fans' reaction surprised you? You mean uh, in, in acceptance or rejection? Either way. Um, you know, probably the most the most amusing thing for me is is to the character I have John Chen, who is used primarily as a, as a humor foil. But I probably ever since I introduced him, if you don't if you haven't read my books, shame on you. <laughs> there's, there's a character who appears in, in some of the Ellis and Joe books, John Chen, who's criminalist for LAPD's uh, SID, and and John is is frustrated in in, in the romance department. Uh, and I've probably received well well in excess of a thousand emails from from, from people. Who all plead with me to let John find fulfillment, <laughs> and, and it, it, that moves me. No wonder it takes you um, up to the right, right up to the deadline to finish your book if you're reading a thousand emails about John Chen. No, I have people who do that for me. <laughs> they tell me about. It. Okay, obviously Joe Pike um, was a character that, first of all made it through the first book, and he piqued your interest, so you evolved him, and he kind of took the lead on some. Yeah. Well, let me elaborate, he, because some of them may not, may not I don't know, maybe, maybe three of you won't know this, but in, in the, in the uh, um, I never thought of the, when I wrote The Monkey's Raincoat, which is the first, I, I never thought in, that this would be a series. I mean, I was just trying to sell one book, um, and <clears throat> so, I'm also an outliner. So I figure everything out in advance, and, and I had figured the monkey's raincoat out. You know, I had it all on, you know, here's my graph, here's all my little note cards, chat, you know, all the scenes. And because I'm writing a single standalone book, I just thought it, I, I could have this really great, <laughs> surprising, hit you in the back of the head, you're not expecting it, super moving moment right at the very end where Joe Pike is surprisingly killed. And when I, so I'm writing the book, and that's what I'm thinking. But when I got to that scene, uh, I had fallen in, in so much love with that character, the character appealed me, I could not bring myself to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're telling me. <laughs> thank, thank goodness. But I kept, so I kept it, I just had a movie. Um, but that's, that's, that's really the genesis. I never, uh, and didn't know, the, by the way, that the series, until we sold the book, uh, and that's not like the royal we, I meant me and my agent, but until we sold the book, uh, and the publisher we finally found a home with uh, asked for multiple copies, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, multiple, a multiple contract, they wanted more. It had never occurred to me that I would, I would be doing more. And you went, oh my God, I used all the ideas in the first book, what am I going to do? Exactly right, yeah. <laughs> Any other characters that kind of whispered to you that might... Kind of take on a life of their own. You know, my problem, uh, I, most all my protagonists do, and I, and I guess that makes sense because otherwise, why would I write about them if, if I didn't find them appealing or interesting in, in some way? Uh, so there's Max Holman from The Two Minute Rule, and again, that was a standalone one shot novel, but there is enormous potential there, I think, for, for more books. Uh, that's just a, a question of, of, of how I allocate my time. Um, Demolition Angel was a one-shot, but that again was a case where it, that's the, the first book, the book in which I created Carol Starkey. But I liked her so much that I brought her into Elvis Cole's uh, world, and, and now she's sort of a, a recurring character in, uh, in the Elvis Cole novels. Um, my new book coming in January is a standalone book, it's not an Elvis and Joe book. <coughs> It's about a, uh, an LAPD canine officer named Scott James and his, uh, and his German Shepherd Maggie. Uh, and I already know, I just finished it Wednesday, by the way. And I, I so I'm shell shocked. So, some applause for that one. Yeah. <laughs> but I already know that, that um, the door's wide open for more, for, for more Scott and Maggie books. Um, and that too is just gonna be how I choose to allocate my time in the future. 
So we know at least that neither Scott nor Maggie dies by the end of the book. <laughs> yeah, but why bother to buy it or read it? <laughs> no animals were harmed in the writing of that book. <laughs> but you started your career in um, Hollywood. Yes. Writing for TV. Not quite true. Okay. Almost true. I actually started as a short story writer. <coughs> uh, I, when I was, I've been writing since junior high, and I was serious about it, uh, meaning I submitted tons and tons of short stories and got tons and tons of rejections. And, and then finally, they, you, know, you, just, you, you get those first few sales. And, um, uh, but you're getting paid 50 bucks or 75 bucks or $125 for, for short stories. It's sort of tough to make a living. So, um, so you went to school for so you went to school for engineering. Yeah, I, I, I never took writing classes or any of that stuff. I was uh, um, I was I was like fun in my family. Everybody either works for Exxon or they're police officers. So I was I was kind of funneled into doing a normal thing for for a living, and uh, and I went to college to study mechanical engineering, uh, which was a disaster. But I was always a closet writer. Uh, and I know there's a lot of aspiring writers in the audience. I gather that from, from, from the fact that there's workshops in, in here and things like that here. Uh, I'm from a place in my family um, and situation at the time where not only was my, my writing not encouraged, it was actively discouraged as, as a waste of time. So I, I became what I, literally a, a closet writer. You know, I wanted this thing so badly that I would write in secret. And no one knew what I was what I was doing, and you know I would submit them, and stuff would come in the mail, and you know I'd make excuses and <clears throat> and all this junk. But it finally started to sell, and when it started to sell, it, I took it as an affirmation. I know this. Then I took it as an affirmation um, I, that that I had some kind of a, a talent or ability to write. And therefore, if I was going to jump off the cliff and actually try to be a writer as opposed to do something normal and stable for, for a living, <coughs> that I should do it now. And so I did. So I went to uh, Los Angeles to try to get into TV. Why don't you tell them um, at what point in your college career? You I had one semester left to go. I, didn't, I never graduated. I'm not a college graduate, so I'm probably the least educated person here. Uh, but I had one semester left to go, and I said, screw it, I'm going to go to LA and try to write. That didn't go over well. <laughs> um, I've heard you say that you got your training in writing female characters from writing um, for Cagney and Lacey. Yeah, I, I so I, now I'm in Hollywood and I'm writing uh, a lot of cop shows and I'm on staff at a lot of cop shows. And one of the shows that I worked on was Cagney and Lacey with uh, Sharon Glass and uh, Tyne Dale. <clears throat> and my boss was a, a, a novel, now she's a novelist. My boss was a woman named April Smith. Uh, so, I spent all, almost, not quite a year of my life, writing two strong female characters, Cagney and Lacey, and then on a daily basis, working with these, these three strong women who all know, uh, what it, they know drama, they know dialogue, they know all the things that you, you need to know as a writer. And I think that experience, uh, like in my books, post Cagney and Lacey, because I wasn't writing books back then, that, that predates my novels. Um, I really enjoyed writing women characters, and in fact wrote Demolition Angel in part because I wanted to see if I could write an entire novel from the point of view of, a, you know, with a female protagonist. And, and a lot of people have said that, yeah, yeah Trace, you can. <laughs> and, and I think that's probably uh, uh, grows out of the Cagney and Lacey experience from working with Sharon Tyne and, and April. So did they ever come to you and say, um, what, what were you thinking on this? this, this yeah, a couple work. of times. I, I could, you know what, I don't, it's all kind of hazy now because that's so long ago. But sure, you know, there's nothing like, uh, it, there's only one thing. Um, <coughs> I, I, I worked in TV for the first 10 years of my quote unquote professional career. And, and that sort of drove me into, uh, into novel writing. I, I, was, I was looking at the, I was watching the comics panel that just happened, and I think it was Kurt who was saying about uh, the difference between working for a big company and then and then doing creator-owned stuff. You know, it's like it's, if you're working for a big company and someone else owns it, and and you can't really do what you want. There's no freedom and blah blah blah. So <clears throat> for me, uh, 
TV was kind of that experience. You know, I had some great experiences there. I, I, I think of it as my school for writing, actually. Uh, and I learned an enormous amount there. But I really wanted to do my own thing and not just do other people's shows and, and all that stuff. So uh, I, I think it kind of drove me into the, into the novel arena. But having done so, things like the Cagney and Lacey experience were a great education for all the stuff I would eventually come to write. I had an author tell me in a panel one time that <coughs> he could write a female character, and he, he was writing a series uh, from the perspective of a female character. But he could do that because, after all, he lived with a woman. <laughs> Is that enough? I mean, I know an awful lot of male writers who live with wives, and they don't seem to get their female characters. Well, I can't speak for other people, but I tell you, sometimes readers are funny. <laughs> See, not only do I, I've been married, but I don't know, 6,200 years. <laughs> uh, my wife and I just celebrated our 35th anniversary. And, my, and for a long time, um, <laughs> piece of cake. <laughs> for, for a long time, um, for about 20 years of that, my wife was a practicing psychotherapist. Uh, she's a smart one in the family. So I remember when I wrote, it was Demolition, I think it was Demolition Angel. So I, I, there was a, uh, Something about Carol Starkey and, and, and the way she was destroying herself by smoking and all kind of stuff. And so I got this one letter from from a uh, from a from a, a female reader. I mean, and she was livid. You could just see the apoplexy <coughs> on, on the email. And and she says, "It's clear you know nothing about a woman. You should consult a shrink about your horrible." <laughs> uh, so I wrote her back and said, "I live with a shrink. Yeah, she happens to be a woman, and she thinks I'm fine." <laughs> so, um, what what prepared you to write from a dog's perspective? <laughs> Man's best friend. I I um, I'll tell you what what here's here's the thing, and I knew this would be weird going into. I mean, here's Robert Grayson, and he's, he's going to write. You know, everybody knows him for Elvis and Joe, and now he's going to write a book about a dog. Um, and I'll tell you right now, there are scenes from the dog's point of view. But what uh, what I, I took very seriously and did not want to want to do was anthropomorphize the dog. In other words, they're not scenes where the dog's talking. You know, where the dog's like carrying on inner dialogue. Um, I did a huge. In fact, I I got very involved with with, with all these things. The National War, War Dog Monument, a lot of other things. Because as I started the research process, um, I, I, I made it a point to learn as best as the current science says how a dog perceives the world, uh, how and why dogs do what they do, and, um, and then into and not only police canine dogs, but, but military working dogs. Um, so I, it was a real adventure and a blast to write these scenes from the dog's point of view, as best I can, imagining how, what the, what's really going on in the dog's head. And, um, you know, they're not cute, goofy, and funny. If you're thinking it's going to be like that, you're wrong. Uh, it's, it's, it's a serious attempt to, to show how, why, and what the dog feels about this person that, that she is bonding with. And coming out of the military working dog and, and the professional dog handler experience, which is unlike, like you have dogs, you know, we, a lot of people have dogs. The experience that you will have with your dog in a common house is, is totally different than, for example, a military working dog with a dog handler. Uh, when they're, as they like to say, when they're downrange, you know, when they're in Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever it is, the handler and the dog live together 24-7. They eat together. They, they're never apart. Um, they, the only common uh, uh, human presence, by common I mean recurring human, human, human presence, but the other canine hand handlers between their missions when they're back in their canine unit, because then they're <coughs> randomly assigned to other military units, so the human faces they see are always changing. It's always this person, uh, and there are a lot of female handlers, so it's this person and this animal, and, and they form a bond unlike any other bond you can you can 
imagine. It's like creepily, wonderfully beautiful. Um, and I wanted to explore that. I wanted, I wanted to write that. So in, in uh, Suspect, uh, the new book, it's, I, I, I took bits and pieces of, of this research, uh, and, and, and that's really where the novel came about, because it's not so much, it, it is a crime novel, because like, I had to. But it's, it's in the, Maggie's a German Shepherd who was doing her, who was, she was into her second tour in Afghanistan as a bomb sniffing patrol dog. Um, and her handler's blown up and she's, she's shot by a sniper and she recovers, but she has PTSD. She has some enduring uh, problems and injuries. And, and dogs, by the way, get PTSD just like people do. And at Lackland Air Force Base, they attempt to retrain those animals and they do the best they can. Uh, dogs suffering from PTSD have anxiety <coughs> disorders exactly like human beings. They're medicated with exactly the same medications, Ativan, Xanax, et cetera, et cetera, to try to moderate those anxiety issues. Um, so Maggie is that animal, and she finds herself being gifted to, to LAPD's canine program. Um, but, of course, because she has her problems, the, 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 the canine program doesn't want her, you know, they can reject her because they, they, got, they got dogs. <coughs> Uh, Scott James is an LAPD officer who, uh, on the last night before he's going to move from a regular patrol officer status to one of the elite LAPD units, he and his and his partner are, are blown up on a, uh, you know, they're cruising in the middle of the street actually looking for a noodle shop, and, and they're caught they're caught in a gunfight, and his partner is, is murdered um, and shot, and, and Scott is, 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 is shot multiple times and suffers <clears throat> on do had multiple surgeries um, and he comes back on the job He's, he has PTSD too um, he just doesn't know what else to do except stay on the job even though they try to get rid of him and force him to take a medical and all this other stuff so now why does he go to canine he kind of winnows his way into canine because he doesn't want to lose another person and so he figures if I do this I don't have another person there it's, it's just a dog so the story is how Scott and Maggie come together and how each helps the other to heal. And uh, I just, it was like the most interesting, fun experience I think I've had as a writer of any of my novels. Yeah, I really like it, so it's... it's Elvis and Joe might have to uh, watch out. They might be bumped down on the... the uh, Unless I bring Scott and Maggie into the Ellis Bowl, you know? What kind of character is the most fun for you to write? You know, Elvis and Joe. Um, I, 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 I find them that fast. I know, I know what the usual answers are for, for that kind of thing, like, the, oh, the bad guy, or the nut, or, you know, the, the funny character. And those, those characters are all funny. But for me, there's something about Ellis and Joe. There's a reason I've written 15 of them. Um, I find them fascinating. There's something about those, those two, two people that I love to spend head, head time uh, with them. I love to work them in scenes and, and see them play off each other, play off other, people's, <coughs> other people, other characters. So I, for them, nothing is better for me uh, than sitting down and knowing I'm going to be with, with Joe or Elvis or both of them that day when I'm working. Not saying it's always easy. By the way, not saying in a pure sense it's always like fun, ha ha, you know, it's like plenty of hard, nasty, rotten, bad days. Uh, but when it's all over and done with, those are the moments I think with those two guys that uh, give me the greatest sense of satisfaction. And for us as readers, there's a lot that's still undiscovered about both of them. Hopefully, characters. yeah, yeah. Um, now, having the experience of writing for TV and writing novels, do you find that you have to approach your characters any different? Do people um, react to them different when they see them on television as opposed to reading them in the book? Well, also, you're not on TV, as you know. Um, but when you're writing, when you're when you're writing for film, I mean, it's a it's a whole different end experience. Um, you know, the books are head theater. The great thing for me about, about the book, and, and it's why I choose to do it, uh, and I had fun doing the other stuff too. I mean, you know, I mean, I had some not fun also, but um, 
I simply prefer uh, novels. And the reason I do is, uh, is because it's actually, I consider it an incomplete art form. Uh, it's, it's not complete until you read it. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it, it, it's probably pretty close to, the, to, to radio in that way. Um, you know, I, I think of words, they're printed on paper or, you know, e down to your Kindle. Um, but they're just, they're just this dead thing that's like, I mean, you look over there and it's just like a blur of spines. And so they're all dead and they're sitting there. But they, don't, and, but they come to life when somebody opens a book and starts to read it. And in that moment, we collaborate. And one of the cool things that I've learned over time, for example, is that if you've read my books, each person in here uh, has their very own version of, of, of Elvis Cole or, jo or Joe Pike. And the reason is because I've contributed what I contribute, but you bring your own identity to reading it. And you know, so Elvis is going to look a little bit different for, for each individual. So in that way, the novelist or the, or the, the writer collaborates with his readers, and I, I totally did that. Now, I once heard you say that um, compared yourself to Walt Disney when you started writing novels, that you were in charge of everything, and you weren't, you were no longer just a cog in the system. Yep. So um, I was wondering when you were going to buy out Stephen King and merge the two empires together. No, he's got his own thing going. <laughs> I'm happy with mine. Um, one of the results that came from writing for television, or maybe it even was before that, is the fact that you're very visual. Yeah. And uh, most of your books have resulted as um, some kind of visual image that you had prior to um, starting. So with Suspect, where where was the visual image that started with that? Um, the, it's, it's, uh, here's, here's what, here's a, a, one of several, this is, <clears throat> Here's what I learned of. There was a, there was a, a marine uh, dog handler from Camp Pendleton and uh, uh, who was, who was uh, uh, killed by a suicide bomber in, uh, in Afghanistan, I think Iraq maybe. And, and his dog was wounded, but the dog, and the dog went crazy because you know, the guy's blown up, now he's lying there dead. The dog got on top of him and, and would not let anyone approach him, including the other Marines who were trying to help him. But she didn't know, I mean, you know, it's a dog. Uh, and, and, and she was in that place where <clears throat> her, I mean, every bit of DNA in her body said, he, he's, you know, this one's mine and he's hurt and I have to protect him. Um, and I found that story uh, so moving that I, that's what got me interested in, into exploring the whole the whole military working dog uh, and canine dog dog world, and I found that type of true life scene or some form of it over and over and over again, um, and that just drew me in to to that that amazing bond between human handler and and dog working dog. Um, but that image of this dog literally staked out over her, her dead handler. I, I just, it's right now talking about it, you know, I mean, I choke up because it's so pure and it's so wonderful. But that's, that's the image I carried that with me all the way through the writing. And you'll see it a couple of times in the book. And if you haven't seen it, um, there's an excerpt on NPR of the beginning of the book and that's kind of how Suspect starts. Oh yeah, did you put, did they put that, that entire scene in there? That entire scene in there. Yeah, you can read it on NPR. <laughs> <laughs> so, radio. What? What, no, you go on the next part, but. No, NPR.com, online. It, yeah, online, yeah. And, then, and then there's a link. Or, or, or sorry. Or, okay. um, so you're talking about that, you're getting choked up talking about it now. So how was that experience writing it? When I tell you, um, I finished the book last Wednesday. Um, way late, by the way. Uh, I finished it last Wednesday. I probably spent the entire five or six days leading up to Wednesday. Every day I'm writing the whole final sequence. 
every day, all day long, crying like a baby. Get your tissues before you, um, on the same trip to uh, buy your copy of Suspect.